Education Mobile, quality e-learning experience on the go. Hello and you're welcome to Fusion Mobile e-learning platform. I'm your host for today, Uchen Jacob, and we are studying the subject economics. Today we'll be looking at the study session on market structures. Many a time when we talk about markets, we look at market as just a place where exchange or buying and selling or distribution of goods and services take place. But the idea is this, that marketing can actually take place at any one point or at any time. But actually, we, the uh, uh, exchange definitely cannot take place. That means the essence of market cannot actually be uh, attained or the objective cannot be attained or the essence cannot be appreciated when there is no agreed price. So in other words, we could actually define markets as a place, a point, arrangement or institution in which, or which uh, uh, facilitates the interaction of buyers and sellers for the purpose of exchange at an agreed price. Now, in other words, that means we have just looked at markets being involving goods. We have looked at, mar at markets involving buyers and sellers. We've also looked at markets involving trading activities, which is exchange. Now, in other words, what we are saying is that markets can actually in, we definitely involve exchange of valuables. It could be goods, it could be services. Now, the next point on our outline after the definition of markets is the classification of markets. Now, markets can be classified from two perspectives. Now, market can be classified according to product and according to structures. So that is where the topic comes from, market structures. So which means, uh, uh, but on the sideline, we are looking at markets being classified according to, according to the items being sold, which is the product. Now, according to product, we could have the commodity market, commodity market, we could have the, the labor market, labor market, we'll have the capital market, money market, we also have the, of course, the capital and money market makes up the financial market. We have the stock market. Now, all these are types of markets classified according to the products. Now, on the other hand, we now have markets classified according to structure. We have two basic market structures. The market structures we are talking about, we talk about the first one, the perfect market of what we call perfect competition. Perfect competition and imperfect market. Now, this is going to make the crux of what we are discussing today. But before then, you take a look at your screen. At this time out, you have a, quest you have a series of questions. Take a look at them and we'll be right back. You're welcome back. Now we will be taking a look at the first market structure we are, talk we are talking about, but which is uh, the perfect competition or the perfect market. Now the question is, before we get there, what is actually the structure of a market? It's actually classifying, it, is, it means classifying markets, that is, according to the, the, the players, the number of players, the methods of price determination or output determination, which actually differs in two basic categories. Now, when we talk about those, the first one we are looking at, or definitely we've said there are two types, which is the what? The second and the, the, second, the third and the last subtopics there. The perfect market or perfect competition is, talks about a type of market that involves so many buyers and many sellers such that 
no single buyer or seller is big enough to influence the market conditions. Now, in such cases, uh, in economics, we actually say that a perfect competitive market is actually an imaginary kind of market. But we should also realize that even in such, it has some measure, some left, some part of it that comes to reality. Now, leaving that, perfect competition looks at having been able to have a perfect system. That means the, the, the firms will not, will not be exploitative in nature. They will only be directing their efforts towards making profit. They won't, they won't be actually seeing, they won't be seeing uh, uh, the customers as the, the big cows that should be milked for at all costs. Now, and also, uh, uh, it looks at a situation where factors of production mix free, moves freely without any kind of restriction or without any kind of cost, any form of additional cost to the firms. Now, when we look at this whole thing, it means that the market, perfect market structure actually does not exist. But for, for control, for emphasis reasons, we actually have to study it here. Now, we have actually defined perfect competition as a, as a form of market where, that, where there exists many buyers and sellers. And we said that what? That such that no buyer or seller is big enough or large enough to influence market conditions. Now, question is, what are the characteristics of the perfect competition or what are the, con, con, uh, the conditions necessary for for a perfect market to exist or what are the features of a perfect market. Now the first one, features of perfect competition. The first one we say the award, existence of many buyers and sellers. Existence of many sellers. Three. Homogeneous. Homogeneous or identical goods. Three, absence of preferential treatment. Oh. Next one, that absence of preferential treatment. Free mobility of factors of production. Absence of artificial restrictions. Another one is that firms are price takers. Next one. adequate and effective effective information dissemination now taking a look at these ones okay we have the last one, free entry 
and exit. Now, we said the first thing there, those features, we said there are, what, there are many buyers and many sellers. In such cases, we are saying that the, in a perfect competition, the players who are what producers or sellers of the same product are actually so much. While number two says there are so many, okay, the number one says the consumers are much, as very much and numerous, while the second one says that the producers are numerous, are plenty, okay? Now that it makes it different people doing the same thing means that everybody will want to survive in the same market, so they will have to obey the common market. Now this next one is what? Homogene homogeneous uh, identical goods. Now. In a perfect market, it is believed that the, the, for, the, for the identical price to exist, the, fit, the goods involved should be identical in nature. That means there would, be only, there would only be one type of good that is bought or sold in the market so that the identical price policy can be achieved. Then the next one is the absence of preferential treatment meaning that no one can affect market conditions, no matter the relationship, family ties, or whatever, then it cannot, no one is big enough to affect market conditions, so everybody is treated equally. The next one is free mobility of factors of production, meaning that once transportation, uh, uh, movement of labor is all at no extra cost, which means no additional cost at all. Now, the next thing is the absence of artificial restrictions, which means that no law or anything forbids anyone to be a participant in the perfect market. While the next one says what? That firms are price takers. The market price is not determined by the firms, but only determined by the forces of demand and supply. Now the next part which we look at is that what that there is adequate and effective information dis dissemination which makes every buyer or seller aware of the market conditions so that no one can no one person can actually go against the market conditions. And the last one says there is free entry and exit. Everyone has freedom to choose to be a member or to leave the industry. Now that is about the what the features of perfect competition or the conditions necessary for a perfect market to exist. Now the next thing we'll look at still under perfect competition is talking about price and output determination under the perfect market structure. Price and output determination under a perfect market structure. Now, for here, we said the price and output determination under a perfect market structure. Now, at an earlier, at a particular study session where we studied the theory of the firm, that is theory of costs and revenue and uh, profit determination, we looked at, we talked about the price, uh, the, the firm's profits and where a firm maximizes profits. Now, every firm operating maximizes profits at a point where we say that what? The marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Okay, that's the note, the first note thing you should note on this case. Now, the marginal cost curve represents a firm's market supply curve, which means because the higher the cost, the higher the quantity it is supplying to the market, while the marginal revenue represents the firm's demand curve. So at the point where they intersect, profit is maximized and that is the point where output is determined. Now, going from there, if we have every firm, 
every frame in the perfect the another another note we should take is that every frame, the first note we have said is that every frame maximize the firms maximize profit where marginal cost equals marginal revenue and the second point is that firms the firm has a perfectly elastic demand curve perfectly elastic demand curve perfectly elastic demand curve and this perfectly elastic demand curve represents is average revenue and marginal revenue curve now that means I have okay now the the firm's demand curve is like this, which is the horizontal demand curve. This is the demand curve. We said it's the same thing as the average revenue and marginal revenue curve. Reason is just that the prices for irrespective of the quantities do not increase or reduce. Okay? This is the output or quantity axis, while here is the price axis. Now, at this point, the firm actually if we recall during our theory of production we said that every firm operates in operates in two periods which is the long run and the short run periods now the same thing here within a firm or still operating in the short run we say in the perfect market makes an abnormal profit reason is just that it is able to to maintain a particular fixed part of its cost which makes the average cost to be quite lower now here we'll have average cost or average total cost like this and definitely when we studied the relationship between average cost and marginal cost it looks something like this right so you can go to back to that section of the video you will see that now at this point output is determined at this point point a point a is the output determination remember we said that marginal cost equals marginal revenue is the point of profit maximization and that is the point where output should be the output uh, that should be produced now over here this is the marginal revenue curve which is the horizontal curve while here is the marginal cost so which means this point b or point q rather is representing our the quantity or output level and O is the origin while P is the price. Now, looking at this, this price is the, is the revenue as well. And here is the average cost. So which means for what it costs us to our total revenue. Our total revenue means I have what? P, A, O, Q. now meaning that this whole box here represents the total revenue price times the quantity all right now but at point b here at point b we have the average cost of producing one this is the average cost curve this is if we are producing this out with this is the average cost then what happens if this comes here we have a point c which represents the what the cost here so at the cost here this is the total cost the here will be definitely now what happens is that it costs us this to produce uh, to sell it, it costs us c to produce a unit and it costs us p uh, we sell at p which means times the quantity we uh, 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 get so cost minus revenue gives us profit but here we also we already know that because of the market price we are already maximizing profit at the price we sell so which means that because of the point of our average cost the firm makes an abnormal profit in the short run which is represented by this point here okay that means that my abnormal profit abnormal profit is P A C B, which definitely our cost cost is what C B O Q. 
subtracting CBOQ from PAOQ, we have APACB, which is the abnormal profit. Now, that is talking about price and output determination in the short run. Now, but in the long run, what happens is that the firm, there is a lot of player, other players coming into the market. And what happens is that the crowding out effect takes place where all the, all the profits or abnormal profits by a firm is shared or distributed out to the competing firms. And definitely what that means is that the, for the firm to actually retain its market share, it has to incur more costs. And in the long run where it varies all costs, then the average cost curve moves higher than where it used to be. So we'll have something that looks like this. This is long run, a long run firm will have this, this is D equals AR, which is equal to MR. Now, this is my average cost curve now, AC in the long run, and here becomes my marginal cost, okay? Long run average cost curve, and that means here Q is our, So, which means the, all the uh, abnormal profits generated within the short run has been distributed among the new or the competing firms. Now, over there, moving on from there, we now have the other point because during production, we advise that a firm should, up, should maintain pro, uh, production at stage three. Of production which is where total diminishing which is the stage after which product uh, diminishing return sets in for paraventure a firm is a firm moves beyond stage three and experiences diminishing returns it means that even at higher output is having what that's a uh, at higher uh, 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 investment of factors of scale it is having lesser output in relation to that so what mean what that means is that a firm will continue to a point where it is no longer to take care of its average cost. And such a firm, the point where a firm is not able to take care of its, its average cost, is referred to as the shutdown point. Now, keeping that in mind, we move to the next structure, which is the imperfect. market of course like we talked about market perfect market as a market where there exists many buyers and many sellers the imperfect market structure actually looks at a if a, a, a market structure where there either exists few or many single few or many buyers single or few buyers and many sellers or many many buyers and few or single sellers which means that it actually negates some features of the other one now secondly this it means definitely since it is imperfect certain conditions or the perfect market does not hold for instance, features of imperfect market competition, of course, definitely there are what there is no free entry and exit. There could be free entry but not free exit, or there can there might not be free entry, but free there will be free exit. So definitely in such case there is preferential treatment because all uh, there is the presence of price discrimination. There are few buyers and many sellers or single buyers and many sellers or in other cases single seller or producer and many buyers those things and there is also the what this information restrictions firms in such case are called price makers not price takers now in such cases we have certain types or categories or classifications of imperfect market structure we have the monopoly monopoly we have the duopoly, we have the oligopoly, and 
some other types that deals with the what with the seller side here it says we have is a market structure where there exists a single producer or seller and many buyers will make up your what your mono poly market structure while the second part is what saying that we have the that duopoly says that we have is a market structure where we have two sellers or producers and many buyers the third one oligopoly is talking about a few sellers or producers and many buyers but now the one that has some good or more extensive quality at this level or uh, uh, descriptions at this level although before i move on there is the what the one you have monopoly of course the one that has single buyer and many sellers we call that monopsony monopsony that means defining the same thing from the from the buyer's point of view monopsony so looking at this of course the same thing goes with duopoly we have duopsony and oligopoly which goes with uh, oligopsony now but the main kind of imperfect perfect, uh, imperfect market structure that we'll be looking at is the monopolistic market uh, structure. Now, we have what you have, what you would call the, what, the pure monopoly. We have the monopolistic competition. Okay, before that, we have the bilateral monopoly. We have discriminating monopoly. And we have monopolistic competition. Now, these four things relating to monopoly, or four terms relating to monopoly, says that monopoly, pure monopoly definitely is the one we have defined, that it is just a market structure where there exists only one producer or seller of a product and so many buyers patronizing, whereby so definitely there are, there could be different, uh, differentiated prices, there could be preferential treatments as the case may be maybe due to discounts and so on and so forth then information is restricted or taken not at, there's, it doesn't allow free flow of information on market conditions and so on and so forth now but when we talk about the bilateral monopolistic agreement bilateral agreements or bilateral talks is just between a buyer and a seller definitely the buyer actually wants to be the sole distributor or seller of the producer's goods. So in other words, they go into bilateral talks after which an MOU or memorandum understanding is signed. Now, in such cases in Nigeria where we have LG products, LG products is only marketed and distributed solely by Fuani Nigeria PLC or the case of orange drugs and some other producers of drugs outside the country. Now, over here, over there, you, that means that the bilateral monopoly is an agreement whereby uh, there is there, there is a single buyer and a single seller of one product now um the next one is what discriminating monopoly uh in the short form of that is a monopolist that practices price discrimination of course definitely almost all the monopolists most of them practice what price discrimination Nation. But a discriminatory monopoly is a type of monopolistic market where a single product is sold to different consumers at different prices, that at varying prices. So in other words, we are looking at where people, the, the obtainable situation where two people can haggle for prices and one person gets to buy at a higher price while the other gets to buy at the lower price price now that is what uh, discriminating monopoly but now that means like we dis discussed just now that what price discrimination exists what is 
price discrimination on what and what are the things that bring about or that must be put in place for successful price discrimination. I have said that price discrimination is the act or the, the practice of selling the same unit of a product to different, to different consumers at varying or different prices. So, but now, that is what we talk about. That is the, that is the meaning of price discrimination. But on the other hand, what, are, what would be the conditions that are necessary for successful price discrimination? First of all is conditions for price discrimination number one is the existence of separate markets two no interaction no interaction there must be no interaction between members of the same of the market of the separate markets Thirdly, elasticity of demand must be different. in the markets. Now we have conditions that must be necessary for successful price discrimination here. We have the first one we said was the existence of separate markets. Second one is that there is no interaction between the members of the separate markets. While the third one talks about elasticity of demand, different elasticity of demand in the two markets. While the last here says there must be there must be varying costs there must be varying costs of uh, maintaining the two markets the two markets now that is, those are conditions that are necessary for the existence of successful price discrimination. Now, existence of separate markets definitely means that you have to, you have to actually establish two markets that are different from each other. These are the conditions necessary for a successful price discrimination to take place. First, we said the separate markets must exist. That means that the, the, the customers sh should be divided into, should be segmented into categories, not just, uh, it could be segmented by location, by class, by demography, and so on and so forth. Then, but in any case, that this, the, the, the segments should be separated or the market should be separated from, the, from each other. And secondly, there must be no relationship or kind of interaction between the members of the separate markets for instance you have a market for what for uh, uh, the, the the influential or the affluent people while you have for the world for the medium and low income group now the affluent people you they they, they, they you should try to make there not be a, a a relationship between the two markets now thirdly is that the elasticity of demand must be different in the markets the elasticity of demand could be elastic. The, the product could have substitutes in a particular market, while in another market it is highly, it is not substitutable. So in other words, they, in a place where there's lesser substitutes, there's likely to be higher prices, definitely because there are, the demand will be inelastic. While on the other one, this, where there are substitutes, the producer would actually have 
will be trying to make sure that prices are not increased too exorbitantly or should be reduced but definitely at a lower price than so that he will have more patronage because definitely when demand is elastic then it pays the firm more to increase to reduce prices now the next the last one but not the least is that there must be varying costs of maintaining the two markets meaning that the cost of the maintenance or cost of uh, uh, running the two markets must not be the same and these are the conditions would say that it facilitates successful price discrimination now that is that about discriminating monopoly and the, the next one we talk about here is the monopolistic competition now for monopolistic competition here monopolistic competition is a type a form of monopoly in which <coughs> there exists buyers and sellers in a market where the buyer the sellers produce where there are few sellers producing similar but differentiated items they are differentiated but under a particular regulation now those things whatever product they sell is not identical because they are not exactly the same but uh, they are similar in fact they are they are very close and similar in nature now in such case the monopolistic competition the market is much more competitive and the prices in most case is determined by the industry while so in such cases the the the, the firms become price a quantity adjusters also <coughs> in such cases the for a monopolistic competitive market then the demand is much more elastic than when you have than what you have in a pure monopolist so we are to discuss the price and output in determination under a monopolistic competition now for a pure monopolist or anything in monopoly first just like the just like the the case in perfect competition one profit is maximized where mr equals mc that means is where output where profit is maximized then secondly firms are price makers or quantity adjusters three there are downward sloping demand curves uh, average cost curves and marginal cost curves now for the pure monopolist for the pure monopolist in the short run he also makes abnormal profit so but in the short run where it is just one monopolist and demand is elast is inelastic that's the difference between the monopolistic competitive market and the pure monopolistic market now for that i have output here i have price or value now this this is the marginal revenue and this is average revenue now if i have the average cost which is that what now happens our marginal cost go this way marginal cost and av average cost now what this means is that for this producer 
profit is maximized at this point where marginal cost equals marginal revenue where they intersect let's call that then it is moved to this that means this is the average cost of this quantity average revenue re realized that means that this is the price mm -hmm. now at that price this is the q our units of output produced and this is o so my total revenue is POQR mm? and now at that price I have the average cost here which is C and A. Now it means that this man has, this uh, monopolist has an abnormal profit within this region here. Now meaning definitely that I have at the point of profit maximization when he sells this in the short run he makes an abnormal profit like so but in a monopolistic competition now the in a competitive market you know we said it is a market where we have few producers of similar but differentiated items so in essence they produce different things but it is just that those things are similar in nature now in such case where there's a competition in the market that means the market has extended so the demand becomes more elastic because of substitutability now this is output and here is price so leaving this i will have these two like so here will be the av marginal revenue here is average revenue so meaning that i could have i could still have then here is the av marginal cost here is average cost as well now this is my profit maximization point meaning that i have this price so profit maximization is at this point now over there this is q and here r p c and o now what do we notice that in such markets there is what there is lesser profit but as time moves on the profit in the industry is distributed among the competing firms such that there are no longer abnormal profits now what are these things what causes what brings about monopoly and what are the things that actually cause monopoly now monopoly could be caused causes of monopoly or sources of monopoly power First things could be caused by what? Natural resource endowment. It could be caused by technological development. It could be resulting from industrial integration. Integration. It could be caused also by through issuance of patent laws, patent laws and copyrights. Also, acts of parliament. and you have what market regulation now either of these six could cause monopoly or could grant monopoly power to firms now the first one is natural resource endowment leads to things we call what natural monopoly and this is a form of monopoly which is granted by the ex excess endowment of 
or rich endowment of certain natural resources to a certain area. Now, some countries and some regions are actually richly blessed with certain kinds of resources. Now, some places are able to produce more oil than the other. Some have precious stones, some like gold. Some areas are rich in coal, iron ore, and so on and so forth. Now, the second one still talks about technological development, that is, level of industrialization, things that could make people, make a society be independent or be a producing organization. Now, the third one talks about what? Industrial integration. This is in terms of merger and acquisition, or what we call Amalga Mission of Industries. When we talk about merger, the combining firms lose their identity and their management to an entirely new firm. But in acquisition, two firms, one buys over the other, while the second one loses its identity to the one that is to the mother or holding company, which buys it over. Then the other one, patent laws and copyrights are, uh, are rules, institutions made to guard or to protect other people from producing parts or a whole of a, of, uh, of, so of a producer's product or commodity. Now, while patent laws lead, uh, relate to manufactured or processed goods, copyrights relate to works of literature or art. Then the, last, the next one, Acts of Parliament, are laws that establish organizations to actually provide or sell or produce a specific kind of product or service. And the last one, but not the least, is what market regulation. This is a temporal form of integration, temporal form of industrial combination, where producers of similar items actually come together to actually regulate the supply of the of the, pro the common product among the markets. In such cases, they could make quota on or segment the market to different uh, areas and regulate the prices as well. Now, I think with that, we have come to the end of the study session. You will also come to have a look at the questions again, which will be flowing on your screen. And where you have issues, get back to the video. I know it will be solved.